So, how's it going, guys? Look, you guys could actually see my little shed that I go into to do these uh, true crime videos or whatnot. You know, the more produced stuff happens in there. But today, we're gonna sit out here in the sun, risk getting bit by mosquitoes, but it feels good out here. Today, we're gonna talk about a man named Stuart Unger. If you guys have never heard of Stuart Unger, you are in for quite the ride. So the best way that I could describe him is that he was a complete degenerate gambler with the emotional IQ of a toddler. He was an habitual drug user. He would make and destroy fortunes, as well as destroy his own family in the process. But on the flip side of things, he was the most gifted and the greatest card player of his generation. He was a mathematical genius and in his lifetime spoke vehemently against drug use. And if you were in his inner circle, he would be generous to a fault and his family did love him to the very end. I mean, who's a more polarizing figure than that? So this is basically the cautionary tale of one Stuart Unger. We're gonna call him Stewie for the remainder of this video. And I've, I've read this book many, many years ago, and I would come back and revisit it every time I needed some type of motivation or inspiration. It's very strange, it's an autobiography, but depending on where your mind frame is, what you take from it, it's a self-help book disguised as an autobiography. And it's probably my favorite book of all time because every time I revisit th his story, I, I tend to lift these restrictions, these, um, these limitations that I impose on myself and I'm pretty sure when you do things like this like YouTube or whatnot you tend to give yourself certain limitations this is why I'm outside right now I didn't do this before but I revisited the story of Stewie and here I am outside my shed <laughs> I'm touching grass and I guess the only thing I hope for next is that I tell the story of Stewie Unger well enough that you yourself can take away from this video something that you could add to your life, your situation, you know, to help you. But if all that happens is that you want to gamble harder, then I've fucking failed. <laughs> How's my background? Good? Alright, let's tell a story. So it's 1967 in New York, and we have this very young child walking up a flight of stairs with $20 in his pockets. That's significant because back in 1967 is equivalent to $200 today. So that's a lot of money for a kid to be carrying around in this mob ridden time where the mob has pretty much has their hand in all these tills, you know, taking taxes. So this kid is going up a flight of stairs and he finds himself in front of a door. Now, when he opens this door, he finds himself in an illegal gambling parlor. Now, what he sees inside actually makes him very upset because he sees men and women, you know, all these grown folks losing everything in their wallets, losing everything on the tables, you know, losing their mortgage, losing their life to gambling. And it makes him really sad. But the thing that makes him really sad about this is not because they're losing their money, is they're not losing their money to him. So he walks around this little parlor, you know, it's probably cloudy with cigar and cigarette smoke, but this little kid cannot find a place to sit and play a game of poker or whatnot. So he looks around disheartened, but then he sees a well-dressed older man at a table by himself and he's playing solitaire. He goes up to the old man and goes, hey, you wanna play, is that a good kid voice? Hey. You want to play a game of cards? Man looks at him and goes, man, this kid can't be but 10 years old. So he decides to amuse the kid and uh, amuse himself also. Says, okay, kid, uh, what game do you want to play? Kid goes, how about some gin rummy? The old man goes, hey, well, how much? $20. All I have is $20. Uh, the man goes, all right, kid. Right, it's uh, He's doing nothing but playing solitaire, clears the table aside, and starts handing out a game of gin rummy. And when he looks over across the table at this little kid, he couldn't help but be amused. Ooh, the sun is coming out. Let me see if I can darken this filter a little bit. I'll try to hide it with my head. So as the man deals out, you know, uh, 10 cards to the kid and 10 cards to himself, uh, he couldn't help but find it so cute that this little kid could barely even hold these 10 cards in his hands, okay? So what the little kid didn't know was he had just asked Arturo Rubello 
which is highly regarded as one of the best Jin players, if not in that parlor itself, but in the city, to play a game of Jin Rummy. And not only that, he was a made man in the mafia. So now the game is lined up and they start playing the cards. People around them, they're not paying attention. They're waiting for their turn at the poker tables or the blackjack tables or whatnot. And suddenly, they hear this little kid's voice yell out, Jin! And everybody looks. They go, wait a minute. Did Art Rubello, certified master of Jin Rummy, just lose to what looks to be a prebubescent child? So Art is a little bit confused by what happened in the first game. So he starts dealing out a second hand, okay? And suddenly, you hear the little kid's voice yell out, Jin, again. And the people now look over once again and they're, they're intrigued by now. They, they, they're jabbing at Art Rubello just a little bit. You know, it's just, yeah, you know, did you just lose to this child, Art? Get it together. And so he passes out the third game. And what Art Rubello sees when he looks over at this focused, intense little demon child staring right back at him reading everything that he's gonna do and he felt a little bit apprehensive i mean he already lost two games to this kid what is this kid who is this kid and so in this third game everybody's around the table and the kid yells out jen three games in a row he took six hundred dollars off art rubello a made man in the mafia the kid you guys leaving you're heading out right now? Alright. You have space for me, Carter? Now, shortly after we got back from Utah, my wife breaks her foot. She missed a step and it completely broke. And we didn't know. She walked on this foot for the next five days in pain. You know, a broken foot, we don't know what to do. So I just looked at her and I just said, so what's the next step? She probably didn't find that very funny, but I did. And that's what counts, right? But anyways, back to the Stewie Unger story, okay? So Art Rubello, he had just got brutalized by this child in front of all these people that know him to be one of the best, right? He didn't get this far in life. He didn't become a made man because he's a sucker, right? So he stands up, digs his hand in his pocket and pulls out three crisp $20 bills, hands it to the kid, and just watches the kid gleefully grab it and run out the door. Now, what Art Rubello did not know, or anybody knew at the time, was that this kid would grow up to be Stuart the Kid Unger, one of the greatest, if not the goat of Jin Rami itself, and go on to become arguably the best poker player of his generation. If you've ever met Stuart Unger, it's been said, you would be in awe of how fast his mind worked. He talked fast, he even walked fast, but he was able to process situations and informations at lightning speed. He basically had a built-in calculator in his head. So, so God basically gave him hardware top of the line. So when he opened up Stewie's head and installed photographic memory, it took, it ran perfectly. But like a lot of things in life, when you stuff in a lot of one thing you kind of lack in another area and for Stuart Unger his IQ was cranked up to about 140 and up but his EQ his emotional intelligence was a bit lacking and he wanted his life story to be told but it wasn't for clout it wasn't for his self-aggrandizing purpose it was so that people could learn from his story of fearlessness and genius. But because of the parts that he lacked, it also made for a very heartbreaking story. And we're gonna get into that. And the only way to know this man is, hey, let's go to day one. So in Manhattan's Lower East Side, on a cold September 8th of 1953, Stuart Arrow Unger would be brought into this world to his Jewish parents Isidore and Faye Unger. He also had a sister named Judy and they would be raised in a nice middle class family. But only middle class as far as the IRS was concerned because the bulk of the income that was not reported pretty much propelled the Unger family into the more wealthy category. You see, Isidore Unger, which we'll just be calling Ido, he was a shrewd businessman 
and he didn't let scruples or good business practice or even the law prevent him from making more money. Ito had purchased himself a bar called Fox's Corner and it did very well. The liquor was flowing, the food was selling, but it was only the strength of the illegal gambling part that made Ito very happy. And Ito, he knew how to play the game. And because this was Manhattan in the 50s, you weren't about to open some small mom and pops casino without the mafia getting their hands in some of that action. So now you have wise guys hanging out at the bars with just regular old Joes talking about who knows what, everybody having a great and horrible time in a cloud of smoke. And interestingly, it was very often that Stewie and his sister Judy would wind up at the bar after school. He would get acquainted with the clientele as well as the wise guys. He thought these guys were so cool, so quick-witted, faz mouth, and he looked up to them. And they in turn became like mentors to him. Even years down the line at Stewie's bar mitzvah, a bunch of made men attended it, nearly giving the FBI a stroke. And so this was basically how six-year-old Stewie Unger spent his childhood. So he was exposed to this environment really early on. So there is no mystery of where he got the habit of gambling from. But his father, Ido, who was a very, very strict man, he forbade Stewie from ever gambling, making sure that his son understood that gambling is for suckers, warning him that if he ever caught him gambling, that he would get the beating of a lifetime. And Stewie would listen. I mean, he was just a child. If only for the fear of your father, he would listen. So Isidore Unger was a very interesting figure in Stewie's life. On the one hand, he was the provider. He put food on the table and a roof over their heads. But on the other hand, he was shady. And Stewie, he was sharp enough no matter what age he was. I somehow I'm convinced Stewie was never really a kid. And Ido was a smart man, though callous, did notice early on that his son was special that his boy had that calculator in his head since stewie was hanging out at the bar after school anyways ito was gonna put this boy to use on top of loan sharking which he did on the side isidore was also a bookie taking sports bets and by the time stewie was seven he was handling the books for his dad. So he understood that his dad had less than wholesome business practices and the businesses that they were in were just downright illegal. But that's not to say that Stewie didn't love his father. He feared his father, but he did love him. But that also doesn't mean that he had to respect him. And he was a means to his education in gambling. And as a young boy, Stewie was absolutely obsessed with gambling. So it was only a matter of time that Stewie would be in the alleys shooting dice with some neighborhood kids for money. He was technically rolling the dice on when Ido would actually find out, which his father would eventually do, catching wind that his boy was out there gambling, disobeying his orders directly. So staying true to his word, Ido that night when he came home found Stewie sleeping in his bed, slapped him across the face, waking him up abruptly. Stewie was crying, but that only fueled the anger in Ido to just mercilessly keep wailing on uh, little Stewie. Now, Faye would burst into the room crying, trying to get Ido to stop, but Ido was not the kind to listen to a woman. All he did was just basically reiterate to Faye what this little scoundrel was doing out in the alleys. And Ido would basically just stop when he felt like stopping. And of course, it would take a while for Stewie to recover. But once Stewie was back on his feet, he was back at his dad's parlors doing the bookkeeping again. And here we get a semblance of what Stewie is to become. Because not only is he doing the books again for his father, he is also back out in the alleys shooting dice with the neighborhood kids. So now you get the sense, he was born this way. He was born with this hard fucking head, basically to protect that beautiful mind of his. And not only that, he would push the envelope even further. Now mind you, he's technically from a rich family. He does not have to steal, but he started stealing. He enjoyed the thrill of doing things he wasn't supposed to do. Once he stated in the book that he just loved the idea of getting something for nothing. And his little reign of terror on these local shops would go on for quite some time. That was until one day the Unger household got a phone call from one of these shops to inform Ido Unger that his son had been caught stealing gum. 
Ido Unger would find out and give Stewie another beating. So other kids, after one severe beating, they would probably learn their lessons for years to come, if not a whole lifetime. Well, for Stewie, it might have took this second beating, which left him pretty bad off. The fear of his father was becoming more palpable. Now, I want to clarify that the beatings that Stewie took were not for his own good, and uh, let me explain that. I would say that if Ido Unger was alive today in this world of social media, he would be the guy to post pictures of his perfect family, drinking his latte, checking his Rolex in Hawaii. So you start to get the picture of who this man was. So it really wasn't for the fact that Stewie was gambling. It wasn't because he was caught stealing. It was because these were things that he deemed as degenerate behaviors of poor people. It made him look bad. Ido was the kind that had to let the next man know how wealthy he was. His kids couldn't just show up to school by walking or even by bus. They were brought to school in a taxi and his wife and himself, they wore nice things. They were caught in nice places eating at fancy restaurants. Now, I wouldn't go as far as to say that Ido didn't love his family. The impression that I got was as long as they stayed in line. So, as chaotic as Ido appeared to be, there was a little balance in Stewie's life, and that was his lovely mother, Faye. So, it's a bit important for us to know how Ido and Faye actually met, okay? So, their union actually started in sin, because when Faye started to date Ido, she was well aware that Ido at the time was completely married. And at the time, she was perfectly happy being his little side piece. But over time, she found out that she really cared about Ido. And I guess with a little self-respect, she told him, you know, if you don't leave your wife as you've promised me multiple times, I am going to leave you. Now, in my opinion, if it was up to Ido, I think Faye would have been his side piece for the end of time. Ido does strike me as the guy that wants to have his cake and eat it too. So with this ultimatum, it actually forced him to realize that he actually did care about Faye. And she was described as a beautiful little firecracker with curves in all the right places. So watching those curves leave him, I mean, Ido couldn't let that happen. So the man went through a messy divorce and immediately started a family with Faye. So the issue with starting a relationship in the manner that these two did was that Faye was always in fear that Ido would have a woman on the side to break up their marriage a la karma. But what can she do? She had to push those fears aside and be the best wife and mother that she could be. Stewie and his older sister Judy, Faye was that love, that nurture that they really needed to balance out Ido's chaos. Though the firecracker in Faye would diminish over time under Ido's control and she was pretty much a pushover. Uh, by the times the kids had their way with her, they could do pretty much anything they wanted. The father would be one of the biggest corporations in New York. He was a millionaire with a million event prospects. The thing is, my father hated when I gambled, you know. And I was very afraid of my father. I was afraid of my mother. So basically, Ido would just throw money at Faye so that she could go get the necessities for the kids, necessities for herself, the family, himself, and then he would just go missing for the rest of the time. Work, right? Although, Faye did have a vice that she could not live without. And Ido knew he had to bankroll this too. And that was, she also loved to gamble. Now from his treatment of Stewie and the way he talked about gamblers and whatnot, we all know how Ido feels about gambling. But when it came to Faye and gambling, Ido would actually encourage it. So with his connections, Ido could find her a seat anywhere for the next gin game, for the next poker game, give her some money and go, Mwah, sweetheart, go and have fun, and then go ahead and disappear himself. So now being that Faye is the main caretaker of their children, Stewie and Judy usually had to accompany their mother to these gambling sessions. For the kids, they would just go off to the side and play board games amongst themselves. Judy didn't mind, but sharp little Stewie, of course. His father, Ido, was practically contradicting himself right in front of him. And from here, you could probably tell that Stewie developed his bullshit radar 
early from being around so much of it. It was that kind of contradictory behavior that left a bad taste for Stewie about his dad. Now, let's touch on some of Faye's abilities in gambling. Let's just say that if Stewie inherited his genius at cards from anyone, it definitely was not from Faye. She was awful, basically donating money every session. Stewie would be watching at his mother's side, absorbing the nuances of every single hand, every single game, like a sponge. And eventually Stewie couldn't take it anymore about how his mother was playing. He would be whispering in his mom's ears about what to do next. And Faye would come back with, but my cards aren't good. And Stewie would just come back, but they don't know that. In short, Faye Unger was hopeless when it came to bluffing and she would eventually lose whatever money she had. But to Faye, winning didn't matter because money didn't matter. She was there to have a good time, chit chat and have fun. So it really didn't matter. Perhaps it was also a good way to take her mind off things and maybe fill the void of an absent husband. But nonetheless, it really pained Stewie to see his mom play so poorly when it was just so mind-numbingly obvious to him. It annoyed him greatly that the other players, they were behaving very smugly around their mother when they themselves, to Stewie, were playing like dog shit and only winning because his mother was worse. He didn't understand yet that what his freakish little brain was doing was special, that no one around him had the same abilities that he had, but as he got older, he would start to realize. But then the fear of another beating from his father, of course, gave him pause. On July 25th, 1967, things would change for the Unger family forever. Ido Unger suffered a massive heart attack and died. While having sex with his mistress, in her apartment. Needless to say, Faye was devastated to learn that Ido was gone, but learning that he had been unfaithful the whole time sent her spiraling into a depression. She didn't ask for much. She just wanted to be happy in her role as a mother and as a wife. And as much as she suspected it, the betrayal from Ido still caught her off guard and it broke her heart. And if we wanted to pinpoint any moment that her spirit, that her physical body started to decline, it was this moment here. Now, Stewie was a gifted student before, and he was a gifted student even after his dad passed, so nothing changed there. Now, it was without the threat of his father's punishment. He was finally free to challenge his theories and put them to the test. And the only test that he could think of was gambling. He entered a local gin rummy tournament and won the whole fucking thing. Happily giving the money to his mother because now they actually needed the money. They were not doing too great. Now you might wonder, well, what happened to all that money Ido was making? He must have been stashing it somewhere and you would be right. He was stashing it somewhere. But you also have to subtract all the money that he spent on mistresses, luxuries, paying off the mob, and those corrupt police shakedowns. And of course, the biggest gangsters of all, the IRS, he had to hide this money. So he hid sizable lumps of money in various drop boxes, drop boxes, deposit boxes all over town. But unfortunately, he didn't share this information with his wife. So now you have all these drop boxes, drop boxes, deposit boxes with large sums of money and Faye had no idea where to begin. Though she did wind up uncovering two because he used the surname Unger with them and she was able to recover those, but the rest was gone. So Stewie would wind up skipping the seventh grade, but they should have just skipped eighth grade as well because he found that easy and boring also and the only thing that challenged his mind was cards and even though Ido was now gone those mob guys that used to hang out at his parlor they took a liking to Stewie and they would vow to look out for him in the family and with plenty of underground gin rummy games to play they brought a 14 year old Stewie to these back rooms and at this point Stewie was just basically allowing himself to do 
whatever the fuck he wanted to do now. And here's where he would borrow that $20 from his mother, go beat Art Rubello for 60. Now the thing that happened after he beat Art Rubello was that the word spread quickly throughout the gambling circles about the kid that sunned Rubello for three games. Now the bar owner of where they played was so impressed by what he saw that night that eventually he summoned Stewie for a meeting. And he was going to offer this kid, he's 14 years old, but looks like he's 10 years old, was going to offer this kid a job at dealing. And Stewie didn't hesitate to show the boss that he could shuffle, he could flick the cards precisely, all the while easily managing the wagers on the table. Now, Stewie had always been physically undersized and a baby face to match. So it was actually hard for him to gather the cards back after he passed them out, gather the chips he had to reach. He was sitting on a Coca-Cola box to, to, to give him some height. But to the owner, this didn't matter. Stewie's competence more than made up for his lack of size. So once they shook on it, the kid's schedule was to show up three nights a week, deal the cards, and make himself $80. That's $745 in today's money. Now I just want you guys to imagine something real quick and see if it doesn't bring a smile to your face, okay? So imagine if you're a regular at this bar owner's fine establishment of liquor and gambling, and you're just finding yourself a seat at the table only to see what seemed to be a damn 10-year-old on a booster seat ready to pass out the cards. And if that isn't ludicrous enough, just imagine that 10-year-old bad-mouthing, talking shit to the people that are playing, calling them stupid for the things that they did on the poker table. He's calling out bluffs, ladies and gentlemen, as the dealer. This would probably be amusing to a lot of onlookers, but if you're the man playing and losing your existence on this table, you might find that a bit annoying. Now this at the time was definitely Stewie's dream job. He got to be around gambling. He was basically getting paid to further his education in cards. He was sharpening his already razor sharp skills with every hand that he dealt and he would do this until he was 16 years old and bringing home this money that he was supporting his family with the very thing he loved. Isn't that what we all aspire to achieve? But... When his mother, Faye, received a phone call from the school counselor saying that Stewie had been truant for a long time now, she was distraught and at the same time didn't know what to do. She raised her kids with love but without any tough love. That was Ito's job and she was well aware that her kids were staying out to ungodly hours on school nights and sometimes out all night. Cut. Hey baby. What are you doing back here? Come over here. What are you doing back here? I'm making a video. What video? I'm making a video about a man that lived his dreams. Is that even true? <laughs> it's true. Why? Mwah. All right. So where was I before we were cutely interrupted by my little baby? So Stewie's sister Judy, she was cutting class as well, but her vice was not cards. She was dabbling in something even worse, which was drugs. And his concerns for his sister would prompt him to be very vocal about drug use going forward. Now for Stewie, he would drop out of the 10th grade completely to immerse himself into the gambling scene. He was fully addicted to the thrill of the bet, the adrenaline rush, the gambler's high. Now, we must never forget that Stewie grew up around actual mobsters. But there was one crime figure that really took a liking to Stewie because they were technically built from the same type of mental cloth. His name was Victor Romano, and he was part of the Genovese crime family. Now, Romano, he spent half of his 50 years at this point in and out of prison and he was a brilliant man. One of his parlor tricks was that he was able to recite the entire dictionary verbatim, just give him a word. He was also a savant in cards, able to calculate complicated odds effortlessly, just like Stewie did. When the two got together and started talking one night, they would wind up talking for hours on end, just about card strategies, gambling strategies. So by the end of this first conversation with Stewie, Victor Romano was so impressed by this kid that not only did he take him under his wing, he took the kid 
into his family. He even got Stewie an apartment, you know, for those nights that he didn't want to go home. He would even invite Stewie to come on over on holidays to spend time with him and his family. Victor Romano's own children would complain that their dad liked talking to Stewie more than with them, which was true. The two, every time they got together, they would just talk about the intricacies of gambling. And neither ever seemed to tire about talking about this subject. Now, Victor was important to Stewie in more ways than one. He found an intellectual finally that he could talk to. He also found that father figure that he always wanted, but I would almost say most importantly, it gave him the luxury of protection. The kind of protection that only mobsters can give you. So he basically could walk into the back room of the seediest gambling establishment and feel perfectly fine because he was vouched by Victor Romano. And this is where he would develop this machine gun light gangster way of talking that he would maintain throughout his entire life. And being so untouchable also cultivated this arrogance, this disrespectful behavior because he knew you couldn't do shit about it. So Victor Romano, needless to say, loved him like his own son. And for Stewie, he got the father that he always wanted, one that let him gamble. So Stewie would find immediate success as a gambler. He would enter big gin tournaments that had pots of $10,000, which is 100K today. He would win a majority of them, and if he didn't win it, he was in the top four. And soon the kid was hopping from one parlor to another, normal people bar hop. Stewie was gambling hop, and he definitely was winning more than he was losing. And he was always, always learning and adding to his game. There was one situation where he would learn a very valuable lesson that would actually up his win percentage just a little more. And in the gambling realms, just a little more meant a lot more money. So let's talk about the lesson that he learned. So Stewie became familiar with a game called Pinochle, and it's similar to Gin Rummy in the sense that you also had to form these melds, okay? Played with a 48 card deck. So he faces off against a veteran of the game for $600. You guys are starting to see that you usually just multiply 10 by any. So 600 is $6,000 of today's money. Now, Stewie totally, totally embarrasses this man by badly beating him at his own game. That's nothing new in gambling. People take bad beats all the time. But to Stewie, looking at this man's face, he had beaten him so thoroughly that he looked like he was going to cry. A professional gambler looked like he was questioning his existence in the universe. Stewie said that this was the saddest face that he has ever seen. And it really made him want to give the poor guy back some of his money. But this was pro gambling and it wasn't about the money. It was about pride. It was about how badly that man was embarrassed. So about a week later, the two would meet again. And surprisingly, the man would return the favor. He would beat Stewie so badly that it made Stewie sit back. And this game was played for even more money. So now that guy is up in their one and one and Stewie wouldn't have minded the loss. He's taken losses before, but it was the man's behavior that caught him completely off guard. The guy was laughing at him, gloating at his expense with his goons. And Stewie would just sit there to think that it was just last week that he was feeling bad for this piece of shit. So from that day forward, Stewie vowed to himself that he would never feel sorry for any gambler again. This lesson served him so well and helped him turn into a complete gambler, a more complete player, technically a complete asshole. So when God put that photographic memory upgrade into Stewie's noggin, Stewie had the ability now to instantly pick up and dissect new card games. He would quickly grasp the intricacies and formulate strategies to be able to beat others at a high level. And he was finding great satisfaction, this is the asshole side, in shattering anyone's self-perception by beating them at their own game. So. 
Another quick story. There's this game called Clab, and it's short for Clabber Jazz, which is a little known card game played in coffee houses in New York and Boston, and only by elderly men who, when they would pass away, would probably take this game with them. And now here you have young Stewie Unger being a certified asshole, learns the game to specifically go to these coffee houses to face off against these old guys who had been playing Clab for the past 40 years of their life and took pride in how well they did it. Just to be beat by this baby-faced jerk, most likely souring the final days of their lives. Another game he quickly mastered was a game called this. I'm not gonna even try to pronounce this. It was a Sicilian game played mostly by members of the mafia. So a couple of those gangsters, they would explain the basics to Stewie one day, and within a week of practicing, he was flexing his skills with some of the most dangerous characters in the city. And don't forget, Stewie is super obnoxious. He really wants to hammer home how stupid you are compared to him. So one night, he was playing a man everyone called Davy K. Well, it turns out that Davy couldn't take all this yapping by this little kid any longer. He grabs a wooden chair nearby and tries to pretty much end Stewie's life for good. He smashed the chair straight down on where Stewie was sitting, which would have killed him if it connected, but Stewie moved just enough to avoid the death blow. A couple of days later, Stewie was playing as usual at the table when he saw this Davy K again. But this time, Victor Romano was talking to him. So he hears Victor call him over, so Stewie goes ahead and goes on over, and Victor forces Stewie to shake hands with Davy K and make amends. Now, of course, Stewie didn't like this one bit, but this was Victor. He did it begrudgingly, and before he left, he shot Victor a stare about, you know, how he was not happy about this. And Victor just looked back at him and gave him a wink, my wink. Oh my. Stewie went back to his seat, maybe not knowing what that wink was about, but he sure will, because two days later, Davy K was found shot to death. So if Stewie ever had doubts if Victor Romano loved him like his actual son, well, he didn't have to look far as to what happened to Davy K to alleviate those concerns. And if Stewie ever doubted that Victor was a proud father, because Victor would tell anybody that would listen that this kid here, Stewie, is going to become a millionaire, he's going to do it with his smarts, and he's probably going to do it with cards. If he ever doubted Victor there, well, his mind was about to be alleviated once again. So as word about the little runt that was making mincemeat out of top card players reached certain prominent gin players, their ears perked up and Victor Romano would be right there to set up basically a meet and greet with Stewie. Now there was a man named Nate Klein who was only known as the Bronx and he was regarded as one of two of the best gin rummy players in all the city if not the states. The other man was known as Leo the Jab. So both these men had dominated the landscape of gin so thoroughly that they were finding it near impossible to get any high stakes action. And of course, here was Victor Romano, serving it on a silver platter in the form of this little pipsqueak, Stewie Unger. For the two of these top gin players, the Bronx and Leo, there was a little hubris going into this, as well as not only did they wanna meet Stewie, this legend in the making, but also to humble the kid and simply go back to sitting atop their mountain. Well, gosh darn it, if Stewie didn't wipe the tables with these legends in less than two hours, securing a $20,000 bag for such light work. So he dismissed the Bronx quicker than he did Leo, but it was Leo that complained, how come nobody told him how good this kid was? And so the kid's legend continues. So at this point in Stewie's adventures, he's what now, maybe 16, 17 years old, Obviously, Stewie is never really home much anymore. Victor saw Stewie more than his mother did or his sister, so Victor told Stewie that he should visit his mother more. 
Great advice. So Stewie bought a heart-shaped box of chocolates and went to her apartment. And what he saw, it just broke his heart. The place was filthy and incredibly foul-smelling. His mother Faye was hopped up on painkillers now and simply stayed in bed all day. And after seeing that, Stewie hired cleaners immediately. He hired a live-in nurse paying 150 bucks a week to make sure his mom was comfortable. And of course, to Stewie, there was only one way to maintain such expenses. More gambling. So there was a man named Harry Yonke Stein. Stein Stein regarded as the best gin player of that generation. Now, Stewie and Yankee met head to head in a game of high stakes gin rummy, but this was not the regular gin rummy. This was a variation called Hollywood gin, popularized by Hollywood. So Stewie basically had to learn the little changes. And of course we all know Stewie can do that in a snap. So they wound up playing a total of 27 games over four hours. Okay, so as I was editing this part of the video, I figured some people might be saying, wait, 27 games in four hours? That's a long time to play 27 games. Okay, so they actually scored it in three columns, meaning every single game of those 27 was actually like a set of three. So three times 27 is 81. So they actually played 81 games in four hours. Hopefully that clarifies it. And it will make the conclusion of this particular story even that much more profound. So let's proceed. And I want you to guess how many games Yonke took off our boy Stewie. What number did you come up with? The answer is fucking zero. A donut. Stu won all the games, leaving Yankee so distraught, basically so embarrassed by his total annihilation that he literally retired from professional gin. The professional gin circles just stopped hearing from their greatest player. Guys, Stewie the Kid Unger was the Kendrick Lamar of gin, and Yankee was Drake. Wah, 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 wah. Dad, fuck him up. <clears throat> so in the course of his progress, Stewie would go on to parlay his growing fame into more high profile matches with other top gin players. Wash, rinse, and repeat to the point where he simply could no longer find any matches. So at this point in the story, I hope you're wondering, just like I was wondering, how can a card game, basically a game of chance, what is it about this game called Gin Rummy that allows one man to be so dominant so thoroughly? So it's played on a standard deck of 52 cards where each player gets dealt 10 cards in the beginning. Now the goal is to improve your hand with what is called melds, which are sets of threes or four cards of the same rank or runs of three or more cards in the same suit. Just reading that, I don't even know what they're talking about. Now, if you don't understand, hey, don't sweat it. We'll never understand it to the degree of how Stewie understood it, so who cares? So in the game, players would keep forming these melds, tallying points up to a predetermined score such as 100. So we already know that Stewie has a T1 calculator in his head, but that alone doesn't make you win at Gin Rummy. What made Stewie so special was that he could remember every card that was played sequentially whether picked up or discarded. He was always observing everything at the table, especially his opponents. Kind of similar to poker in a way, right? And in a game like Jin, one of the most basic things to notice about your opponents is actually where they place their cards in their hands. So if they suck, then they just place their cards in a row, in order. But of course, Stewie's not gonna be playing against the lower rank. He's gonna be playing against more formidable players that are gonna hold their cards more uniquely. So Stewie still has to decipher their placement patterns. And Stewie was able to do this. And as a result, he became the best defensive player less worried about completing his own melds and more concerned about fucking up his opponent's hand. Now, one frustrated player once said that playing against Stuart Unger was like playing with your cards facing up. So, that's basically cheating, Stewie. 
So to most of us, we'll never know what it's like to have a crazy mind like Stewie Unger's. But there was a flaw in Stewie's approach to gambling, basically the same as any of the run-of-the-mill gamblers. And that was knowing when to stop. But Stewie only knew one way to play and bet. And that was pedal to the metal, non-stop, the entire bankroll. So if we're judging on how fast your mind can run, his mind was like a sports car. But what good is all that speed in a sports car if there's no brakes? So poker tables, they're sometimes full. Gin tournaments, they don't happen all the time. But the thing that just stayed in Stewie's brain the whole time was this obsessive need for action. He'd literally, guys, flip a coin if he had to for high stakes. The place that he bets his horses at, there's a man over there called Coin Flip Willie, something like that. I forgot his name. But there was a man there with a coin that is willing to bet you high stakes on a coin flip. And Stewie, on occasion, would just do a little coin flipping for maybe $10,000. But if Coin Flip Willie wasn't available, He'd go on to the pool hall and his ass would play pool against pool sharks without even knowing how to play pool. So this is clearly a sickness. If he wasn't tossing coins at the racetracks, he was laying down so much money on the ponies that he would owe them so much money that he had to lay low. He eventually owed so many unsavory characters money that even Victor Romano's clout couldn't save him. He literally had to leave New York to go hide in Florida for a year. It pained him to leave his mother behind, but he knew Victor would take care of his family, and that gave him a little peace of mind. He received a phone call from New York in 1979. His mother, Faye, had passed away, and Stewie took this news very hard, harder than he thought he would. Prior to her passing, she had suffered a stroke that left her almost paralyzed. But he was driven out of New York because of all his debts and he couldn't be there for her. So he most likely held a lot of guilt for not being there for his angel. Now, Stewie never had much control over his emotions, which is very apparent in the way he gambles and adversity wasn't something that he dealt with very easily. So with this news, he really didn't know what to do with himself. So just know that Stuart Unger had always hated drugs. He grew up around it and he saw what it could do to people and he was very good at learning from example. I never took a drink or did any that was the greatest kid you ever seen. I went home like some friends of mine on and he was a vial of cocaine on the table. And I said, what is that? I've never seen it before. Three. I'm trying to think of sometimes if I, that thing happened that incident with my mother and thought I got involved with it at that point in my life. Stewie wound up using cocaine for the first time. And it helped him cope. It helped him stay awake while he was gambling. It was like a miracle drug for him. And soon he was spending hundreds and hundreds of dollars a day. And... If regular Stewie wasn't rude enough at the tables, coked out Stewie was utterly unbearable. Try to imagine not liking your hand, spitting on the cards, and then flicking it back to the dealer. That's what Stewie did. A man that could do that is capable of many crazy things. So now let's jump to 1980. Stewie is now 26 years old and he's making a life of it in Vegas. He was happy. At least he thought he was, until he was reminded about what was missing. And so the story goes, one day, a friend of his told him that Madeline was in town. Stewie completely froze. All he could ask was, where? The friend told him, and Stewie just bolted. So you see, this woman Madeline was a woman that he used to date when he lived in New York, whom he lost touch with when he had to abruptly flee the state. So now Madeline was in Vegas and she was just standing on a street corner talking to friends when suddenly she saw Stewie running at her at full speed. And it was to be a very happy and emotional reunion for both of them. But she was actually hoping not to see him. She told the friend that told him not to tell him, but of course he did. And within their catching up, she would tell him that she had since gotten engaged 
to a very wealthy lawyer. So Madeline, she had a young son from another relationship named Richie. And when she first met Stewie in New York, this made her remember how much she adored Stewie because of how he treated her son like it was his own son. And Richie just adored Stewie. He was so proud to tell everyone that Stewie was his dad. That's my daddy. That's my daddy. But for her, it also touched on the reality that Richie actually never took to the lawyer the way that he took to Stewie. Now remember, Malin really didn't want to see Stewie because she knew that if she saw him again, she would just melt. And when she saw him again, she melted. So after her visit to Vegas, she would fly home, break it off with the lawyer, in which she described as him turning into a ghost as pale as one, and found herself and Richie flying back to Las Vegas, where Stewie had already purchased a nice home with a view of a golf course for them to comfortably live in. They were a happy little family and Stewie picked up right where he left off with Richie and it wouldn't be a stretch to believe that Stewie was being the father that he always wished that he had. Now this has been a very long video and I can't remember if I described the way Stewie looked. So Stewie has always been undersized as a child, but now he's a grown man. I'd like to describe him for you, just like the book described him to me. So on a good day, they said that he might stretch out to a full 5'4". He never weighed more than 110 pounds. Usually he was just at the 100 pound range. He had this long, narrow jaw and a short button nose, which reminded me of when Dwight said that his only flaw is having a short nose. Your nose? It's too small. The geometric proportions of my face are perfect in every way but one. My nose is too small. He was a speed walker and a speed talker. There was no time to figure out what the man was saying because if you were to ask him, what the fuck are you? He was already gone. So in the book I read called One of a Kind, there's a brief description about Stewie that I felt captured him so very well. And the description was, he was a man who was by equal turns fascinating and infuriating, inspiring and frustrating, generous to a fault, and selfish beyond all reason. What that's saying is he's basically a walking contradiction if there ever was one. Not intimidating by the physical sense whatsoever, but there was no contradiction when it came to his card game. Once you sat down at the poker table, Stewie was already sizing you up. There was no one more intimidating once the cards were dealt. So, in the 80s, there were two major poker tournaments to play in. There was Benny Binion's World Series of Poker, and there was Armarillo Slim's Super Bowl of Poker, and he entered the WSOP, the World Series of Poker. Now, he would wind up accomplishing feats that still to this day have not been outdone. So, he showed up to the WSOP after torching the gin scene for three tournaments, and he was looking to do the same here. He did play in a WSOP the year prior. This was his second poker tournament in this event, which for a guy like Stewie was more than enough practice. So there were 73 entrants in the 1980 World Series of Poker. Now this baby-faced 26-year-old read and folded his seasoned opponents who were easily decades older than him and it caught the eye of Doyle Brunson, which is a legend of the poker scene who's also won three of these himself. So Doyle kept his eyes on Stewie and described his talent as freakish, how his gameplay improved with every passing day. And when Stewie finally made it to the final two tables, he called his dear friend, Victor Romano. They had never lost touch and Victor would have loved to have been there for Stewie, but he himself had been dealing with some health issues. Now Stewie told him confidently, Victor, I'm about to win this whole fucking thing. Victor is probably the biggest believer and supporter of Stewie. So when he heard that, Victor said, I'm catching the next flight. So after this phone call, he knew he couldn't let Victor down. He was more motivated than ever 
to win the entire thing. So he walked back to the floor, sat down, and he just started to vanquish all his opponents like some damn wizard. Player after player would be dismissed and the crowd would go wild with every dismissal. And by the end of the day, it was down to the final nine players. Stewie sat comfortably as second place chip leader at $93,000 worth of chips, only bested by a man named Gabe Kaplan, who had 203,100 chips. Doyle Brunson was at the final table as well, and Stewie knew he had to be sharp against that assassin. So on the third and final day, the audience was huge, which now had Victor Romano sitting in the stands and like a proud father, was looking at Stewie beaming with pride. So the way the tournament paid out, they only paid out the top five. So all that bluffing you might have done for the past two days might have been for no money at all. Actually, you lost money from the buy-in, which was I think $10,000. So you still might go home with minus if you were the first four to go out at the final table. And guess who ran into a bit of bad luck and was bounced first? Yes, the chip leader, Gabe Kaplan. So in the book, it said that Doyle Brunson, who is usually the most aggressive player at the table, realized that he was up against another assassin that was even more assassinish. Assassinish. And so it was only fitting that the final two players at the final table was Doyle, who had only 44k in chips, against Stewie's. 300,000 plus in chips. But Doyle is still an assassin and he would put up this masterful performance to get back within contention and Stewie definitely had to have been sweating it as Doyle's chips began to rival his own. But on the final hand, Stewie had been setting this trap for Brunson's since they went head to head. He had been betting a certain way, knowing that Brunson would notice and would be calculating his every move. Now, after getting what he called his Miracle 3 on the last turn to make his hand a straight, he said that his heart was pumping, but outwardly completely stolid. His demeanor didn't budge an inch. It was time for him to unleash the trap and see if his opponent bites. So what he wanted to do on this hand after getting a straight was for Doyle to think that he was bluffing. So he had been fairly aggressive in his wagers, but on this hand, he added just a tad more to the wager and calmly pushed $40,000 worth of chips into the center. And because of the way that they had been wagering, this was a pretty considerable wager. Once Stewie pushed it in, Brunson just sat back in his seat for a whole five seconds to assess the situation, but soon he was back and pushed 274,000 of his chips all in. Everybody in the crowd tensed up. It was an exciting moment. Stewie excitedly jumped out of his seat and called the bet. And the next step of the game was to see what each player was holding before they revealed the final card. And of course, once Doyle Brunson saw that Stewie had a straight, his heart sank. He was duped. But there was still one more card to be turned. And Brunson had two pairs. He had two aces and two sevens. So if the dealer flipped an ace or a seven, Doyle Brunson would win another WSOP. So everybody watched anxiously. The room held their breath as the dealer knocked on the table customarily and revealed the final card. It was a harmless two of hearts. The room erupted and Stewie Unger had won his first WSOP. He was the 1980 World Series of Poker champion. Doyle Brunson, ever the professional, had kind words about Stewie. He said, in all the years I've played poker, I don't think I've ever seen another player actually improve as the tournament went along. He used the World Series and all of us as a training ground. Stewie went home that day with $365,000. That's $1.5 million today. Stewie, Madeline, and Victor Romano went out immediately that night. They ate, they drank, they were merry. There was nothing in the entire world that could bring them down. And for Stewie, there were no two other people, barring his mother, that he'd rather share this moment with. Stewie Unger was very happy.
And then that night, Victor Romano went back to his room at the Caesars, and six hours later, Victor would be dead. He has suffered a massive heart attack. So in the greatest moment of Stewie's life, the universe didn't even allow him to even enjoy it throughout the night. Stewie took Romano's passing very hard. He took it harder than when his own father passed. Victor was a man that looked out for him when he didn't have to, took care of him, gave him guidance when he didn't have to, allowed him into his house even on the holidays to make sure that the kid knew that he was wanted. Those were probably very crucial times in Stewie's life and Victor Romano was there for him. Even when he fled New York, Victor's voice was the calming, comforting guidance he needed. Now he's gone, which left Stewie very susceptible to the chaos that he's always tried to avoid. And for a man like Stewie, there was only one thing that, at least for a while, took his mind off things, gambling. 1981. Stuart Unger steps into the World Series of Poker again. Being the reigning champion at this point, he definitely wasn't going to catch anybody off guard. Now, they all knew his name. They all knew what he was about. He was there to prove that his first win, that was no fluke. And this year's tournament would outdo last year's tournament by a whopping two more players, okay? There were 75 entrants this year, but all the legends of poker were again there, such as Doyle Brunson, Armarillo Slim, Bobby Baldwin, and Stewie. And Stewie would again, masterfully, take down opponent after opponent until he was at the final table, across from a man named Perry Green. The final game saw Green with a 10 and a 9, and Unger with an ace and a queen, with the board showing 7, 8, 4, 4, queen. Green was praying for a 3 or a jack so that he could make a straight, but Stewie would win with his two pairs. And at just 27 years old, Stewie would again win the World Series of Poker, and he won another $375,000. And the poker world was astonished and had to acknowledge that there was a new kid in town that was possibly the greatest poker player in the world. So after Stewie's victory, he decided to focus more on his personal life. And on September of 82, he and Madeline got married and Richie became his legal son. Two months later, their daughter Stephanie was born. And according to the book, when Stephanie was born, Stewie was just beside himself at how much he could love another being. He just loved Stephanie. It sounded like he found peace, doesn't it? He was on top of his craft, he was rich, a multimillionaire by today's standards, respected, and most importantly, a family that loved him. What else could a man want? Well, that's, that's the thing, right? If that man was Stuart Unger, it's the same thing that he's always wanted. Action. But the problem this time in the way he was approaching action was that he was doing copious amounts of cocaine. And this addiction would turn into a thousand dollar a day habit. He had snorted so much of it that it had eaten the membranes of his nose away, and his nose collapsed. He started wearing a pair of glasses to hang off his nose, as if it would hide his appearance, his friend said. He would say that he would fix his nose, but he never did. There was always something more pressing at any given time, which, of course, was action. Stewie's nose collapsing pretty much marks, if we had to pick any physical indication. It was his nose that pretty much marked the beginning of the end. So there's a rule for professional gamblers, okay? Your only goal is to increase the bankroll, but Stewie never seemed to grasp that simple logic. If he had $50,000 on the books, he would use all $50,000. And just like he did when he was younger, he was just throwing money away at things he had no business betting on. And then he would get back to the poker tables and definitely he was still brilliant there. That was his environment. And he would go on to own 
the rest of the 80s. So in 1984, when Michael Jordan entered the NBA, Stewie Unger would go on to win the Super Bowl of poker, cementing his place in history now. But he wasn't done by a long shot. He would win it again in 1988 and then again in 1989. A trifecta. The, so to put it simply, Stewie would go to the poker table to get money. Then he would blow it onto all types of wagers and silly bets. And then he would sit down at the poker table again and re-up and celebrate again. But there was another tragedy waiting for Stewie that would cut any celebration short. So you see, all the broken promises were piling up for Madeline, his wife. And in 1986, she finally had enough of Stewie's irresponsibility, his erratic behavior, so she filed for divorce. The impact of what Stewie was doing on the family, of course, was bad. And no one could really say they didn't see it coming. As we know, the apple of Stewie's eye is his daughter, Stephanie. Even she told her father that she didn't want to see him again unless he stopped doing drugs. Now, don't forget Richie, guys. How much Richie loved Stewie probably isn't a way to describe how much Richie admired Stewie. But because of all the things that Stewie was doing and now he was pretty much absent from Richie's life, Richie himself started to spiral out of control. Now, it's not to say that Stewie didn't love his children. He still loved Richie immensely, even though he wasn't his own blood. This is just how Stewie was. This is just, this is just how he even treated the people that he cared about most in the world. So when Stewie came into Richie's life, Richie was just a child. He was very young and he took to Stewie right away and he loved Stewie and Stewie loved him right back took him to ball games took him to other events just like a father and son and he just, Richie wanted to be just like Stewie when he grew up and it affected him more than anyone imagined when the parents got divorced and he really didn't see his father that much anymore so in 1989 the same year that Stewie won his third Super Bowl of poker Richie didn't come home. He would be eventually found in a Hilton parking lot, hanging from a rope. It's not clear why Richie took his own life. And all we can truly say is that life became too overwhelming for Richie. And when Stewie found out about this news, <laughs> he was completely broken. I will not show any tears in public. I uh, ever show any fear or anything, you know, not any circumstances, you know what I mean? It was burnt to the head, it was back my way. I promised myself that I was deceived by my son committing suicide. And he would constantly just blame himself for Richie's death, in which he never forgave himself for. He just sunk into his vices and further became a recluse. So as the entire world was ringing in the 1990s, Stewie found himself divorced, he's addicted to cocaine, and Richie's death would pretty much haunt him constantly. In the 90s, it just didn't look much better for Stewie. It became one long nightmare. Now, in gambling, there's a phrase called bad beats, basically meaning you lose a bet that you were more than likely supposed to win. And that pretty much exemplified Stewie's life for the next decade. One story his friend said in the book was that Stewie placed $100,000 on a horse. That horse shot out of the gates like a rocket and it maintained the lead pretty much throughout the entire race. And on the final lap, Stewie watched his $100,000 horse break its right front leg just 40 yards from the finish line. His friend said that Stewie, stone-faced, after that happened, disappeared. Probably went to the bathroom to do a few lines. He came back like nothing happened, and he was ready to bet it all again. His brain was brilliant, but it just seemed like it wasn't able to partition a portion 
for savings, investments. He would enter the same tournaments and not even place. He couldn't win. And at times he would physically not be able to even attend or perform because of the drug use and this is about the time seizures would happen and he would wind up in er and the money was drying up once a multi-millionaire he found himself completely broke the saddest point in all this to stewie was when he wanted to take stephanie his daughter to buy some clothes for school i took my daughter got a real she started looking at price tags because I had took my money. And I said to myself, what did I do? What am I doing? I didn't know a beautiful girl in the world. I mean, a, a gem. And she's got to look at price tags after the money that I went through my hands and I've given away and just millions and drugs. You know, I'm just disgraceful. And I felt so bad for her. She said, what do you about that? It's okay. It, it was so humiliating to me. It was, it was a shame, you know, but for her. He had hit rock bottom, which would make what happened in 1997 just unbelievable. So besides all the shortcomings of Stuart, we shouldn't forget that he still had a tremendous heart. And in his journey in this life up to that point, he had blessed a lot of people with money. He was like the Mr. Beast of the poker world. So now he's Kendrick Lamar and Mr. Beast. Because Stewie never cared about the money, as we mentioned before, if he had $10,000 and you were his friend and you needed it, he would give you $10,000 without any hesitation. And if you don't believe in karma, well, karma is about to kiss Stewie on his hands, on his forehead, where his brain is, that make more sense. So karma was about to pay Stewie back a hundredfold for all his past good deeds. A friend from the past named Billy Baxter, a poker hall of famer, was willing to stake Stewie for $10,000 to buy into the 1997 World Series of Poker. You guys see where I'm going with this? So the tournament, if you guys recall, was had entrance in the 70s. But now the tournament had ballooned up to 312 players since he last entered, or at least since he was last able to perform. So Billy Baxter, knowing that he had just backed a junkie, but a genius, knew that this was a long shot. So he made it clear to Stewie that he would only give him the money on one condition, that if he saw Stewie leave his chair at any time, he was going to kill him. But this didn't stop Stewie from showing up that first day high as a fucking kite. He was pacing around. He was a very diminutive man. Dimini diminutive? A small man pacing back and forth at the back of the poker hall. You know, a lot of people are not going to notice him, but a few people did. And legend has it, the murmurs of the man they called the kid reverberated around the room because he was by far the most feared tournament player still. And to Stewie, he's just there. Barring that he is high, he forgets sometimes that he is a rock star in the world of poker. So as people started to gather around and say hi to Stewie, he found himself feeling really good about himself. He actually really enjoyed all the love and all the attention that he was getting. But it wasn't all positive attention because the players that actually knew him, what they looked at, he looked like shit. The years have ravaged that once boyish good look into more ghoulish figure, especially with the collapsed nose. His whole appearance looked disheveled as if he had just woken up from a fucking park bench. His skin was described as looking worn and thin. Nails were long and dirty. He was unshaven, and unfortunately for anyone who had to be near him, he smelled really bad. But he was the two-time here at the WSOP, and he was a three-time at the Super Bowl. So the respect cut through the stench. <laughs> but true to his word, he managed to stay awake, and he completed his first day of poker. Although... He would sneak away into the night shortly after and go to a crack den. And somehow, some way, 
he got himself to day two of the tournament. And he said that he felt those killer instincts of the Stuart Unger of old take a hold of him. And it became like child's play to him as he bluffed his way through tables, they call them satellites or something, talking shit to his opponents, calling their bluffs, and he just pretty much bullied his way onto the final table. And on that final table, pretty much just dismissing everyone there, leaving just him and a man named John Strimps. And what kind of story would this be unless John Strimp would meet the same fate? Stewie wins the whole fucking tournament. Again. The whole thing was being televised. You could hear the commentator say, Deuce, Deuce wins the tournament. You're older, you're wiser, you're 43 years old. You think you're going to do things differently now? Well, I hope so, Gabe. You know, uh, I've neglected my kid. You know, I've done a lot of stupid things myself. But I want to tell you something for a fact. There's nobody that ever beat me playing cards. The only one that ever beat me was myself. I want my daughter's picture one more time. I love you, honey, and I'll be seeing you soon. Stuart the Kid Unger had won his third World Series of Poker Tournament. And one of the greatest comeback stories of any human being. Someone who literally was living in a homeless state of mind and body. Broke, addicted to drugs, his family left him. And then all of a sudden, the next moment, he's a millionaire again. A three-time world poker champion. So before he even entered this final tournament, I mean, the name Stuart Unger has already been cemented in poker history. And to do what he did coming out of what he was in, he pretty much inspired anyone. You don't have to play poker and gamble. You don't have to be a genius. You just have to have the will to come back from the highest of highs to definitely the lowest of lows. For him to rise from a broken heart, broken physically, a crippling cocaine addiction, just being broke in general, to do the impossible with a picture of the only person in the entire world he wanted to make proud. You don't have to be a poker fan to find this kind of story heartwarming. Stuart Unger grabbed his third World Series of Poker from over 300 players and make it look like a cakewalk. The winner's share of the 1997 World Series of Poker was worth $2 million today. He went from zero to another chance at making things right. But this is Stuart Unger. Four months after he won it. I know you guys don't want to hear it. I didn't want to read it. He was broke again. Stewie never changed. The money was incinerated in all the same places. Sports books, casinos, cocaine. Stewie again was in a free fall straight to the bottom. The 1998's World Series of Poker would roll around and he couldn't even get himself out of bed to attend the first day. And Billy Baxter was fronting him again so that he could go defend his title. Stewie wanted to defend his title. But after that first day, Baxter could see that Stewie was in the worst shape of his life. Stewie wasn't even able to walk out of his room, down the stairs, where the event was. Baxter remembers getting a call from Stewie and him simply saying, I'm too tired to play. So there would be no back-to-back -back that year. And things just kept getting worse for Stewie because later that year he would get arrested for cocaine. And when he got out of prison, his own daughter, Stephanie, the only thing he had anything to live for now, told him that she didn't want anything to do with him anymore. The last thing she said to her father was, I'm not going to answer my phone unless you are in drug rehab. And Stephanie did the right thing. She was leveraging how much she knew her father cared about her, how much she cared about her father, to dig him out of this damn pit that he put himself in. It was time for tough love from the one person he cherished the most. On November 22nd of 1998, Stewie checked himself into a hotel in a part of Vegas known for drugs and prostitution. Stuart Unger was found dead in his room the following day. 
The coroner's report found traces of cocaine in his system, methadone, and prescription painkillers. The setting of his passing isn't fitting of a man that would be comped by any luxury casinos that line the strip in Vegas. But he chose to spend his final hours in one of the worst. But by this time, to him, he probably felt that this is all he deserved. His death would place a dark cloud over the poker community, but to be honest, they all knew the path that Stewie was heading down and no one could stop him no matter how hard they tried. What shaped his personality even from when he was a kid. He was a man that was gonna do what he wanted to do. His death hit his daughter, Stephanie, extremely hard because she never got to tell him that she still loved him one more time. Stewie was on a self-destructive path. And to be honest, I don't think his mind could have endured much more, just that his heart went first. So in a beautiful gesture to a fallen soldier, as you will, the poker community came together and they paid for Stuart Unger's funeral at the Palm Cemetery. So in the final resting place of the greatest gin rummy player of all time and arguably the greatest poker player of all time, very simple stone to mark a very beautiful life, a very tragic life, a very inspirational life for us to take away from. Stewie was just 45 years old when he died, and it's estimated that he made roughly $30 million in his gambling career, but he had a net worth of only $800 when they found him dead on that hotel room floor, which is the $800 that they found in his pocket. And in Stewie's essence, he was just a flawed man, a self-destructive man that searched for what we all search for, love. So thank you for watching this video about Stuart Unger. Hopefully you guys enjoy it and can take away from it as Stuart would have wanted you to do. Make your life better. Pursue your dreams. Do whatever you want to do within reason. Okay. Partition that piece of your brain to sometimes stop. Know when to go. My name is Monks. Peace out. Sub if you enjoyed.